Welcome to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast for Tuesday, July 2nd. My name is Nathaniel White Joyle. Today we are joined by Attorney Terry Lodge, as well as Fairwinds Chief Engineer Arnie Gunderson and President Maggie Gunderson. Thank you all for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Nat. Yeah, good to be back again. All right, Maggie, would you like to get us started? I would. As some of our listeners know, I'm a paralegal, and uh, Fairwinds Associates does expert witness testimony. So I work with a number of different attorneys around the country, and Terry is one of the attorneys with with whom I have worked for more than four or five years. And I, w- I invited him on the show today because I really wanted to talk about or have him speak about what it's like to be an attorney with interveners and how hard it is to get legitimate safety and engineering issues in front of the NRC and have them actually look at them and not bow to the wishes of the industry. You and Terry are on two major cases now. Could you both talk about that to our listeners? And Terry, could you explain what a contention is? Because I don't think some of our listeners know what a contention is. Certainly, I'd be happy to. Um, The process, essentially, is rather different from just writing up a lawsuit and filing something in court. Um, The NRC issues a public notice that they are going to be considering licensing, for instance, in Michigan, a new Fermi Unit 3 plant uh, near Monroe, Michigan, between Detroit and Toledo. That's one of the cases that Arnie and Army is, is assisting us with. And um, th- this is part of that multi-year, e- extremely uh, early process that I was talking about. We filed a what's called a petition to intervene where individuals and an assemblage of a number of uh, organizations such as the Michigan Sierra Club, Don't Waste Michigan, and Ontario, uh, the, the uh, Citizen Environment Awareness Alliance of uh, Southwestern Ontario, uh, a number of organizations, as well as in the Fermi case, maybe uh, 15 or so actual ind- individual interveners, all signed on. And those are your the equivalent of plaintiffs in lawsuits. We filed this lengthy petition stating that they all, uh, that the individuals live within a 50 mile radius of the proposed plant. Um, you know, the, the sort of grounding facts are, are pretty straightforward and that the organizations want to represent various of the individuals and usually there's not, although there can be, a great deal of, uh, there's not a lot of hassle about it, not a lot of quibbling about it, um, but depending on the case and depending on the seriousness of what's going on, that can change. The so-called 50-mile rule, and, and let me shift to another case that Arnie is helping us with, the 50-mile rule is being heavily contested in, in the case of davis Bessie, where we have recently filed a petition to intervene in what's called a license amendment, and the uh, first energy utility that owns davis Bessie, which is about 28 miles east of Toledo on Lake Erie, uh, they want to replace two steam generators which is a major, major uh, construction project and a swap-out of two uh, technologically changed pieces of equipment. The problem there is that the claim is that we haven't postulated enough of an accident scenario that would justify people from as far away as 50 miles radius from davis Bessey should have standing to intervene. So there's a game where the rules change according to the perceived seriousness of the project. i got to say, Terry, that seems pretty frustrating. Are there any other examples of this happening around the country? One of the issues that came up, for example, the Florida case, we found a clear trail of release of radioactive materials off-site into a sewage treatment plant, and then from there, the dried sewage was spread on a farmer's field, and then... The radiation got out into the water table and the food chain. And there's a whole bunch of families in the cancer cluster. And every uh, chemical possibility was examined by the state first. And the case was thrown out of court on the whim of, the, of a newly appointed judge 
who felt that the NRC was the federal regulator and therefore had to be telling the truth. And the NRC had participated in, in the cover-up all the way back in the 80s when this, relation, when this uh, radiation was released. So to me, it's, it's appalling all the hoops that people who are really sick have to jump through. Or in the case of the work you know, Fairwinds is doing with you and where Arnie's testifying on different cases, and maybe you both could speak to some of those specific cases. In that work, we find where the NRC is aiding a cover-up by the utility for them to just get through the licensing process. Let me give you an example there. On, uh, on Yucca Mountain, the state of Nevada hired uh, many experts who wrote many expert reports and there were um, something like 195 contentions that, uh, that were filed on Yucca Mountain. The uh, Department of Energy uh, wrote back, they were the applicant, and they said, uh, they said that the experts were wrong 195 times. You know, that's to be expected. The, the applicant is going to refute the experts, and the experts are going to refute the applicant. But what happened next is amazing. The, the, quote, neutral arbitrator here, the NRC staff, agreed 195 times with the Department of Energy and said that the experts that the state of Nevada had hired were wrong. Luckily, the um, Atomic Safety and Licensing Board judge said this is impossible. You can't have experts hired by a state being wrong 195 times. So uh, that's just one of many, many examples where the nuclear regulatory staff um, agrees with the nuclear industry and opposes public input. I think with the NRC sometimes it's like playing hide and seek. You know, I find that all the time when I'm looking for documents. And, and Fairwinds does rely on, on two researchers who help us with, with some of our research because it's so hard to track critical documents that you need. They just disappear under the radar and they're not numbered or they're or the NRC gives them back to the utility and so they're never filed and they refer to these reports that you can't get any copies in the public document room which is supposed to be where the public can see things. Well another thing we've identified and I think it has affected it did for a time in the quality assurance contention that that Fairwinds was helping with confirming. Um, there would be correspondence going back and forth. I mean not just a letter sent from A to B, but response from B to A, and a counter-response from A back to B, that there would be weeks of documents, reports, analyses being exchanged, and only months after that happened would they be added to the public file, the so-called Adam system at NRC. So six months, sometimes even longer, after events have taken place, even decisions have been made internally uh, to the staff or the utility. Would you finally, for the very first time, see stuff? It, does that happen even on cases where the interveners are already participating? Aren't the attorneys supposed to give you copies of anything that's filed? Yes, yes, but the, the, the determining or the problematic point is when it is filed, when it is added to the public domain. There's enormous, incredible discretion with that. It's something that my research assistant, Michael Keegan, uh, has complained about with considerable evidence to show for it. And it, in fact, if I recall correctly, the, um, there were key documents when we filed the quality assurance, the motion to add the quality assurance contention. We also have a very strict time limit, incidentally. When something appears in the public domain, it appears without fanfare and without highlighting that says this is something that the public needs to read. Constantly have to scan this huge, huge, uh, voluminous online library that is constantly being supplemented by hundreds of documents a day. But in any event, Mr. Keegan identifies this uh, discussion. He comes across this discussion of uh, lower echelon uh, the license violations, or not license violations, but uh, regulatory violations and we file a contention, and while we're litigating the contention, additional stuff shows up in the file from six months before. So, no, it's not all there in a neat package. It's certainly uh, uh, it's a hide-and-seek kind of process, as you say. 
what kind of responsibilities does the NRC have? I mean, I'm, I'm confused to what their role is. The, the role is two-headed at least. The NRC staff is considered to be a separate legal entity that is a party in licensing proceedings. There's a Byzantine little court system within the NRC, and the trial court is called the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, and it is a separate supposed, well, it is a separate entity of uh, judges appointed, they're employees of the NRC, appointed by the five-member commission, which is incidentally, of course, the supervisor of the NRC staff, and the three licensing board judges handle all of what you would call trial matters, and any appeal first must go to the full commission, um, and only after the full commission has uh, ruled on it can you proceed outside the system to the court, uh, which is a whole other rather frustrating process in itself. But so you have the NRC staff um, has enormous discretion. That's where the inspectors are. That's where the internal engineering reviewers and, and other scientific specialties are. Um, and the whole licensing process is not a, a neat, time-bound process either. It's one where um, the application is made and the public gets to intervene and literally for a two-and-a-half to three-year period after that, while the legal-type proceedings are going on before the NRC, there's still a great, much, a great deal of review between the staff and the utility going on. And there is not a, an ironclad obligation for things to be added to the public domain or explained to the public or disclosed other than once they appear in the so-called Adams Library. You know, there's two pieces of that that <clears throat> I'd like to add. The, the first is this 10-day rule where uh, if, if a nuclear plant has a problem, um, and the NRC knows about it, and the owner of the plant knows about it for a year. And then suddenly documentation shows up in the public document room. The public has 10 days to write to the NRC and say that, uh, that we want to file, um, either add to a litigation that's ongoing or begin a new litigation. Does if the NRC alert the public that it's there? No. 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 So these things that's will pop up in Adams. By the time you read them, that's the Adams is the NRC's public document room. Um, it may be um, you know nine, ten, eleven, twelve days. So if you wait till the twelfth day to appeal something that the NRC has known about for a year, the NRC will will, will throw out the contention because it wasn't timely. Yes, and and we've experienced that several times. It's incredible because some of the things that that are turned over, some of the gaffes that are identified are very, very frightening accident scenarios or very frightening actual things that, you know, near misses that, but for some technology reacting correctly or a human being intervening, you know, a, a reactor operator. Yes, it, it's quite an amazing process because, because it doesn't matter whether it's actually a public uh, health or environmentally threatening if, if it's not timely sorry about your luck you know the other one I'd like to talk about is um, um, is the fact that the NRC always lines up with the applicant here you know as an expert I, I was at a uh, hearing in, at, on the Pilgrim plant and it was um, uh, I was on one side of the room with the, with the pro se uh, from Pilgrim Watch Pixie Lambert and on the other side of the room, there were 20 experts and attorneys representing Pilgrim. And then there was another 10 representing the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So it was literally, you know, 30 to 1. And I, I was figuring out, one, the salaries of the NRC and the billing rates of all the consultants. And I figured they were running something on the order of $10,000 an hour um, to refute the report that I had written. Well, the problem that we wanted identified and solved was only a $50,000 problem. So the hearing took all day, and they ran up more trying to suppress the public than trying to solve the, um, the problem. You know, it's a Tweedledee, Tweedledum relationship with the NRC and the licensee. And the problem was leaking underground pipes and how to monitor the site and make sure that tritium and other radioactive isotopes don't escape and get into the water table. 
they just wanted monitoring wells on the site. I mean, in Massachusetts, a gas station is required to have, to have four monitoring wells on its site. But there was no requirement except one monitoring well for a nuclear power plant. And they wanted to equal with a gas station. I mean, oh my gosh. Correct me if I'm wrong here. I just want to clarify something with everybody. When the NRC was created, it was created to protect the public. The, yeah, right? the, yeah. the NRC was created in 1976, and um, it was uh, President Ford signed it in into existence. And it was the old Atomic Energy Commission, when it was developed, was founded to promote nuclear power. So the NRC was formed because it was supposed to be a regulator specifically to protect public health and safety. But all the same employees were there, and all they did was change the name over the door, and they're all still wearing the same hat and the same mindset that they need to work with the industry from what's, whence they came and that they'll probably go back to. Only two commissioners have not gone back to work in the industry after their stint, and that is former Commissioner Victor Galinsky and former Commissioner Peter Bradford. Everyone else has gone back to cushy, highly paid jobs with the nuclear industry, and I think they're always watching their own personal bottom line as they make these decisions. So it seems to me like the NRC is just a extension of the industry, and they just seem to be around to help the industry skirt regulation. It turns out that the NRC identified that uh, the people who, who were building Fermi 3 didn't have a quality assurance program while they were writing the license. Can you explain to our audience why that's important with a nuclear power plant? Um, well, one, it's part of the law uh, that you have to have a quality assurance program. And, and uh, um, what it basically means is that everything you do is, is traceable. There's a paperwork trail to support all of the uh, calculations and all of the uh, all of the core drillings you're doing out in the field to make sure there's not an earthquake. But you got to make sure there's a, um, a paperwork trail to make sure that all of that stuff has integrity. M Michael Keegan discovered some uh, NRC emails where the NRC said, "Whoa, you guys didn't have a uh, a quality assurance program," um, and they no issued a something called a notice of violation. Well, the next thing that happened was amazing. The people at Detroit Edison wrote back to the NRC and they said, well, if you carefully read your rules, you don't need a QA program unless you are, quote, the applicant. That's what the law says. An applicant shall have a quality assurance program. And we weren't the applicant until we applied. So therefore, uh, we didn't need a QA program while we were writing the application but on the day we filed the application, that's the first thing you can, uh, first time you can look over our shoulder. Well, so here's the NRC saying you didn't have a quality assurance program, and here's Detroit Edison saying we didn't need one. And the NRC flips. They said, oops, we misread our own regulations that have applied for the 200 nuclear plants that have gone through this process already. We misread our regulations, and you're right, you didn't need to have a quality assurance program because you really didn't apply until the day you apply. And never mind, Arnie, as you pointed out, never mind the fact that the regulations certainly suggest and contemplate the pre-application period and require an accounting for quality assurance during that period. Even, even with that, you're right, they flip. I'm sure we could go on here with the litany for, for hours of, of where you know, Tweedledee and Tweedledum have ganged up against the, the public. Well, and the bottom line observation I have about that is it, it, people who are kind of new to nuclear jousting are mystified by the fact that isn't this agency supposed to be there to protect us? And, you know, aren't they the original concept of the, the public intervener? And sadly, uh, not by a long shot. It, it's simply untrue. And it turns into a... Um, it's, a, it's almost like a World Wrestling Federation type of thing where there's a tag team of these two giants you know, who are pouncing on interveners. You, only in the rarest of circumstances does the staff uh, legal department back off and uh, assert some type of neutrality in 
some of the contested circumstances. Even down to getting additional time for filing. That, that's another thing. This whole public process uh, requires a strict adherence to timelines and deadlines. You have to make, uh, unlike practice in what I call real court, you where you can often get extensions of time and, you know, people's actual circumstances are taken into account and sometimes court deadlines have to be secondary to, to personal matters or whatever. But you have to beg <laughs> for time. You have to beg to have a couple of extra weeks and you have to consult the other side. And it is, the utility already knows, the utility and the staff already know that uh, you are either unfunded completely or you're working on a very limited shoestring budget. Whether your experts are compensated, whether your attorneys, your researchers are compensated is officially irrelevant. The, the comparative power and resources specifically by NRC ruling may not be taken into account in making any of their rulings. So that easily gets into, uh, it permeates just the informal side of litigation where people take vacations, people have medical appointments or protracted medical treatments, you know, all kinds of personal crises, things that the courts seem to have for hundreds of years taken note of and dealt with and allowed litigants to break. The NRC doesn't countenance that. It's very, very difficult just to stay in, stay alive, have breathing room. I'm surprised at the number of contentions that are brought forward in November and December that may have been sitting for a really long time. And I feel like the NRC looks at particular units and says, oh, we still have budget money here. We've got to move this now. And so we have sometimes been asked in November and December, been given dates and had all this work to do before the end of the year because we're given a due date. It just takes away from any family time, any off time, and they are unyielding on changing the date. It's just unbelievable with with what their demands are. Are the energy companies held to the same standards? Oh, no. <laughs> no. You know, here's, let's look at Fermi 3. Well, Fermi 3's uh, schedule has slipped by three years. They're allowed to slip the schedule, and uh, the NRC says, okay, that's fine. But if the public wants an extra three weeks to respond, that's unacceptable. That is incredibly true. One of the most notable examples is sort of this two-headed concept that we, I think we ought to talk about. The NRC has to publish in the Federal Register and give you 60 days, give the public 60 days to file a petition, intervene, and propose contention. And they have enormous discretion, in other words, as to when to post that notice. In the davis Bessey license renewal case in 2010, they timed the 60-day period so it ended in the week between Christmas and New Year's. And incidentally, when you file, you've got 60 days' notice to comb through, again, the voluminous Adams file to look at the thousands of pages long license renewal application and to decide what experts you may need to consult and what contentions you want to file. 60 days is not a very long period of time to do those kinds of tasks when you're doing it as an expensive hobby, as many of us are. And so what you have is this incredibly tense December, which uh, finally ends with the, you know, the uh, filing a few minutes before midnight sometimes of this massive uh, motion intervene with the contention all through the holidays. And, you know, it's six, when it's 60 days out, uh, roughly at, at the end of October, you have to organize, you have to get documents circulated, you have to try to recruit people to help read, because that's the only notice you really get that the license application is finally pending and being processed. So it's amazing, and, and incidentally, there's one other wrinkle to that that is really troubling. You effectively have what I call, you have to have almost proof beyond a reasonable doubt of the provability of the contentions that you file the day you file them. 
you you have to cite evidence from the public domain as much as you can find, and you can't add to that when you're arguing that the contention should be allowed in. So you have to have you have to marsh you have to use the right search terms, you have to have the right experts, you have to have everything lined up before you file in order to prove your case pretty much in its entirety, which is not at all like the court model. Court model is uh, if I had a if you hit my car and caused me personal injury, um, I can use the court process to discover additional facts as to uh, how the accident occurred, what technical mishaps there may have been. I don't have to know everything that occurred the day that I file. I don't have to have all the science worked out. And that's entirely out the window in NRC proceedings. I'll give you an example of what was really trying in, in one of the cases we worked with um, attorney Terry Lodge on. And uh, as experts, we had to look at a lot of data, both public data and what the industry has labeled proprietary data. So some of the proprietary documents that came in that, that we found, uh, that we looked at in the, in the CDs they gave us, were not proprietary. They were already in Adams and they were trying to claim they were pr proprietary because they didn't want to be embarrassed publicly by what these documents showed. So we had to wrestle with that. Additionally, Fairwinds had to sign the most onerous non-disclosures about this particular case that, that that we've ever signed and we had to sign it for the um, industry, the nuclear industry, and the NRC and the NRC drew these documents and then when we here we signed we're not going to talk about them we're not going to release them we're not going to show them all this stuff and we we did that and then we went back and went to look at the documents and they were locked so I used nine different programs to open them so I could search them nine different search programs and I worked they kept crashing our computers and I worked with a computer expert I went right to his store and and he couldn't open them either so here I was stuck not being able to read anything so then we sent back word to them and they finally sent some readable documents which we got a week before all the testimony was due so there's all this wrangling you're asking for documents that you want you tell them you want documents covering this time they say oh it's going to take us so long to get that and and then when they send it they lock it in a way that you can't search it you can't extract any words from it you uh, just yeah. meanwhile you're on a 30-day clock right and, and the clock doesn't stop because of the fact that the documents, you can't read the documents that they send you. In any other legal setting, that would be declared as a mistrial. Right. Well, in any other legal setting, it would be um, a no-brainer for the two or three parties of the case to agree to extend the deadline to kind of accommodate the loss of time. In some circumstances, I've run into the attorneys for the other side, even though even though it is apparently technical glitches between them and our computers, they deny that they've caused any problem. Therefore, you have to go through the extended process, if need be, of filing a very elaborate motion explaining what you think has happened just to justify to the trial court, the, the licensing board, that uh, we had this big problem and we need more time to make up for it. And in our case, there was one other circumstance that happened. The CD that they sent had a little program on it that was incompatible with our computers. If this is supposed to just be PDF files, why did the law firm which set these up, which is one of the most powerful nuclear law firms in the country, uh, representing all kinds of nuclear power organizations, why did they put this little piece of software that was in incompatible with our computers on there. I mean, it's just not valid. It's just supposed to be PDFs on there so that they, so that they can be opened. And it kept, it was that, I think, it was that little program that kept crashing our computers. Well, let me, let me end this thing on a, on a hopeful note, the, 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 the crocus popping out of the snow here. Um, and, and that's what happened at San Onofre um, over the last couple of months. Um, uh, Friends of the Earth um, 
uh, with me as an expert and, and John Large, a guy uh, from, uh, from England, uh, filed with the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board. Um, and the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board agreed with the fr Friends of the Earth. Now, that was a seismic event in the nuclear industry. What just happened, again, is an attempt to kind of trample that crocus right back into the snow. The NRC didn't like what the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board said. So the NRC filed with the commission uh, trying to get the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board's decision thrown out. This is the NRC staff. Yeah. The NRC's legal staff doesn't like what the NRC's Atomic Safety and Licensing Board did um, because it gives the uh, public too much, um, uh, too much of a say in the licensing process. So the legal staff is complaining to the commission that the um, Atomic Safety and Licensing Board overstepped its bounds. Well, uh, Friends of the Earth and the state of Vermont and the state of New York filed just, just three or four days ago that no, the ASLB was correct and the staff is wrong. That then goes to the commission and they'll make a decision on it. And given that all these commissioners are essentially appointed by the nuclear industry, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the commission's final decision is. But there was a crocus in the snow, and I think we all should be pleased that an Atomic Safety and Licensing Board did, for one moment on San Onofre, give the public uh, a significant new right. When we were working on the San Onofre project, Southern California Edison made a lot of references to Fairwinds and our competency because they had 2,000 engineers and had figured all this out. It was very interesting to have a whistleblower give documents to Senator Barbara Boxer and have those documents validate everything we said with design work that was illegal back in 2004 and these documents were not released as they were supposed to be by Southern California Edison and so Senator Boxer has called for um, an investigation and criminal charges with the Department of Justice. So is it safe to assume that the NRC is going to continue to put up roadblocks preventing the public from participating? One of the things that has troubled me, as you know, you've been helping us a great deal with this latest steam generator swap um, question or contention in davis Bessey. One of the things that the NRC very deftly does, the, the staff, is they raise the argument that you don't really have a right to the hearing, even though the regs very clearly say if there's this type of license amendment, you know, this, this type of serious project is undertaken, there has to be a formal license amendment and the public can ask for a hearing. Well, what the NRC is, what the staff position is, is that, oh no, you're asking that the regulations be enforced that we've that our staff engineers and whatnot have not properly enforced the regulations, and in order to uh, for the public to have any say in that, you have to file this entirely different kind of petition called a Section uh, 10 CFR 2.206 petition for enforcement, and that is a um, as was proven in the San Onofre proceeding. There's actual uh, evidence and a finding by the licensing board that the 2206 enforcement petition process is, by design, a dead letter, that it is totally within the discretion of the NRC staff about whether or not they want to do anything. So what, what you have is where the public is seeking to have a hearing that appears to be guaranteed by the regulation, and the NRC staff says, oh, you're criticizing our work, that means that instead of requesting a hearing, you are demanding enforcement of the regs. So you've got to use, you've got to file the right paperwork. And the right paperwork consigns it to what is well known to be the circular file. So there are, there are ways of diverting and otherwise placating the public that are meaningless, illus illusory kinds of, uh, of processes. And it seems like mostly just an attempt to disenfranchise the public. Correct. But at the same time, to uh, have an illusory, formal kind of mechanism to appear to be responsive to the public. There's been 
402.206 petitions, and the NRC has agreed with two of them. That's half of 1%. The last time I was in Washington arguing at 2.206, um, the, the chairman of the 2.206 Petition Review Board fell asleep while I was talking. Uh, you know, I think that's a good indication of what the NRC thinks of the 2.206 process. <laughs> so it really does seem like the NRC roadblocks are very difficult and very frustrating to navigate around. Has the NRC had a history of disenfranchising the public? The process of initiating um, a public, what I call public participation, in the supposedly open proceedings at the NRC is very hard. It, it has a, a, an interesting history of placing blame and uh, trying to, uh, I think, justify the, the NRC has attempted to justify their the current extremely high walls to participation this way. Uh, back in the 70s, the, the licensing process focused on two lengthy uh, separate proceedings. You would a utility had to apply for a construction license and then at the toward the conclusion of the construction phase an operating license and the uh, the NEPA the National Environmental Policy Act statute was construed very differently um, in, in it had to be supplemented at the second stage and there were there was a possibility of a, a lot of issues that had not necessarily been addressed by licensing boards, which are the equivalent of trial courts, at the first stage could be revived and renewed and litigated at the second stage. Um, as, as we all now know, the history of the nuclear industry in the United States was disastrous. Uh, even before Three Mile Island, dozens and dozens of projected and proposed nuclear power plants were canceled, never built, or uh, in fact many were abandoned in midstream. By the 1980s, the applications had fallen off to zero. Uh, there were still a few 70s era reactors being licensed, but uh, uh, once those were pretty much concluded um, in, in the late 80s, the NRC internally was told by the five member appoint presidentially appointed commission that runs it. The staff was directed to analyze what happened in the 1970s. And in the, uh, about 1990 or 91, a bunch of new procedural rules were, were uh, written and proposed, and the gist of the findings by the NRC staff at the time was all of these interventions destroyed the nuclear industry in the 70s. And um, that while citizen participation was in some respects desirable, it had to be curtailed and more tightly controlled. And all of this is, it, 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 you actually had the specter of a later generation of staff people who weren't there in the 70s, in, in many respects, calling the shots and assessing, and I think in many respects, misinterpreting and rewriting and distorting history. Because as we also objectively are able to know now, the economics and engineering blunders and corrupt contracting and construction practices are what largely destroyed the American nuclear industry's prospects, along with sort of the capper, Three Mile Island, and to some extent, perhaps, Chernobyl. So what you have is this almost Orwellian uh, look back at history in the early 90s that resets litigation standards and narrows things down into one proceeding that is con that is initiated years before construction even begins and is calculated to address all of the problems that or complaints or uh, anticipated design difficulties that sort of thing that the public might come up with years before the designs are approved and finalized years before some of the environmental consequences can even be anticipated. And in light now of what we see in F Fukushima, you, you've got this bizarre circumstance where 
there are a number of plants, of proposed plants, that are in the licensing process, and the NRC has been petitioned by a large coalition of public participants to essentially put a freeze on construction, uh, pardon me, on, on combined operating licenses, and uh, essentially isn't really doing so, pending the lessons to be learned from the Fukushima meltdowns, the disasters that are perhaps lurking in the future. I have to agree with you that it's not public participation that killed nuclear power in the 70s, it was money. The, uh, you know, plants like um, Millstone or Vogel, um, you know, started out at a couple hundred million and went to a couple billion. Um, and uh, it just made no sense to build these things. And that had nothing to do with public participation in the licensing process and everything to do with, um, the, you know, the, the extraordinary cost of building a nuclear plant to make sure it, it doesn't explode and spread radiation throughout a, a state. So it's been to blame the public and to cut back on public participation is, is a little bit like shooting the messenger. Yes, and it's almost laughable in some ways. My dear friend Harvey Wasserman insists, rightfully so in some respects, that citizen participation was a very key ingredient in stopping some nuclear projects back then. But a great many of them, the public was used as an excuse. Public opposition was cited as a reason to abandon a project that, as you say, Ernie, was going six, eight, or ten times the original quoted price. So we can at least say that we're seeing a pattern of behavior here by the NRC. A disenfranchisement by the public by creating an intervening process that is difficult and frustrating. And on that note, I would like to wrap up our conversation for the day. So thank you very much, Terry Lodge. Thank you, Arnie and Maggie, for taking the time to speak with me today on this very important topic. Well, you're welcome, and I appreciate the, uh, the chance to be able to talk about this, especially with people who know whereof they speak. Thank you, Terry, for joining us, and thank you, Nat, for doing this work with us. Yeah, and thanks for our listeners, too, for, for getting to the end of a very important podcast <laughs> on a very important topic. Don't give up the ship. Fair winds I and mean, people like Terry Lodge are out there fighting, and the more of us there are, the more opportunities there are to succeed. This podcast has been a production of Fairwinds Energy Education. Fair